Welcome to our Black History Women's History Month event celebrating Smith College President Emeritus Ruth Simmons' memoir, Up Home, One Girl's um, Journey, which was published in September 2023 by Random House to Great Acclaim. My name is Erin Kamgisha. I'm the Ruth Simmons Professor of Africana Studies. And I'm Janetta Candelario. I'm a professor of sociology, Latin American Latino studies, and the editor of Meridians, Feminism, Race, Transnationalism. We are grateful for the co-sponsorship of the Study of Women and Gender Program, Africana Studies, the French Department and Alumni Relations. Thanks also to Ali Ebenbinder, um, Editorial Office Manager of Meridians, David Osipowitz, an Academic Assistant for Africana Studies, Kat Dolan in the President's Office, Media Services, especially Jeff Heath, all of whom have provided invaluable behind-the-scenes support that makes an event of this scope look easy, and the Alumni Relations team, especially Lindsay McGrath, for making this event available to the worldwide Smith community. I understand that there are over 500 alumni registered as of today, so we want to acknowledge your presence. Thank you very much for being here with us. Uh, we would also like to give a special welcome to President Simmons' son, Carrie Cabral Simmons, who is joining us here today. And finally, thank you to President Sarah Willie LeBreton for immediately and enthusiastically accepting our invitation to welcome our esteemed guest, President Emerita Ruth J. Simmons, and to reintroduce her to the Smith College community. Before turning the event over to President Sarah, please allow us to offer you a brief overview of the program. President Sarah will introduce President Simmons, President Simmons will read a selection from her memoir, Up Home, One Girl's Journey. Up Home brings you from Ruth Simmons' um, childhood as a daughter of sharecroppers in East Texas, who becomes the first Black president of an Ivy League university. It is an uplifting story of girlhood and the power of family, community, and the classroom to transform one young person's life. After the reading, I will join President Simmons on stage for a conversation about the book, her work in higher education, her scholarship, and her central role in the founding of Meridians at Smith College. We hope to have about 10 minutes at the end for any questions you might have, those of you who are here in person, and also we've collected questions from the alums who have registered for the webinar. And then I will return to the stage to close out the event at 6 p.m. and to invite you to purchase the pre-signed copies of Up Home, which are being sold by Northampton-based Broadside Books just outside this room. And now, without any further ado, please join me in welcoming to the stage President Sarah Willie LeBreton. Thank you, Erin and Janetta. And Erin, again, I'm so thrilled that you are the inaugural Ruth J. Simmons Chair of Africana Studies. Everyone, I am so pleased to welcome all of you this afternoon. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing President Emerita of Smith College, Ruth Simmons, as we celebrate her enduring legacy at Smith and her new memoir. After completing her PhD in Romance Languages and Literatures at Harvard, Dr. Simmons served in various faculty and administrative roles at the University of Southern California, Princeton University, and Spelman College before becoming president of Smith College in 1995. While at Smith, she oversaw the hiring of an historic number of faculty of color who are now senior faculty here and who served the college in a wide variety of leadership positions. She launched a number of important academic initiatives, including our engineering program, the first four-year Bachelor of Science program at an American women's college, the Poetry Center, and she supported the founding of the journal Meridians, Feminism, Race, Transnationalism, which published its first issue in the fall of 2000. Dr. Simmons left Smith to become president of Brown University, where she was the first black woman to lead an Ivy League school, and which under her leadership made significant strides in improving its standing as one of the world's finest research universities. While there, she also held appointments as a professor in the departments of comparative literature and Africana studies, 
She retired from Brown and returned to her home state of Texas, but was soon called to serve as the president of Prairie View A&M University, located in Houston. She served as the first female president of Prairie View until just last year, and under her leadership, Prairie View was reclassified as an R2 research university. Dr. Simmons is the recipient of many honors, including a Fulbright, Fulbright Fellowship to France, the President's Award from the United Negro College Fund, the Fulbright Lifetime Achievement Medal, the Eleanor Roosevelt Val Kill Medal, the Foreign Policy Association Medal, the Ellis Island Medal of Honor, and the Centennial Medal from Harvard University. Dr. Simmons is a member of the National Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, and the Council on Foreign Relations, and serves on the board of the Houston Museum of Fine Arts, the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, and the Holdsworth Center for Leadership in Public Education. She also serves on the board of directors of the financial and marketing services company Square. Awarded numerous honorary degrees, she received the Brown faculty's highest honor, the Susan Culver Rosenberger Medal, and was named a Chevalier of the French Legion of Honor. And perhaps most significant for this community, received an honorary degree from Smith in 2014. Most recently, on February 21st, Dr. Simmons joined the LBJ School as its Barbara Jordan Forum Keynote Speaker and received the Barbara Jordan Public Service Award, which honors a trailblazer and leader who represents Barbara Jordan's voice, legacy, and unwavering commitment to building community through activism and public service. Currently, Dr. Simmons is a distinguished presidential fellow at Rice University and advisor to the president of Harvard University on HBCU initiatives. I have followed her career since I earned my doctorate in 1995, watching her unequivocal and yet strategic leadership inspire legions of faculty, students, and staff. Please join me in welcoming the inestimable Dr. Ruth Simmons. That's why I keep him around. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, son. It's such a pleasure to be here with you and to know of the work that you're doing here. Um, one always uh, worries about the future when you lead uh, an institution. Um, and I'm back today and I see all the good works that you're all doing here. And I'm immensely, immensely proud of being associated with this uh, stellar, stellar uh, institution. So thank you. I'm gonna read from chapter two uh, of my memoir, Up Home. One of my earliest memories is of my mother sobbing as she read a letter from my brother, Wilford. Wilford, mama's third child, left home in 1947 to join my oldest brother, Albert, and seek work in Houston. He found a job initially as a day laborer but enlisted in the army in 1948 for a three-year tour of duty. His motivation for enlisting was to earn steady pay that he could send to my parents in Grapeland. Even at a young age, Wolford was family centers, loyal, obedient, and generous. Generosity in the ubiquitously impoverished world we knew marked him as unusual. His good nature, however, made him the object of teasing and bullying by family members and peers. Identified early on as mama's favorite, he enjoyed her protection as well as that of my older sisters and brothers when they saw others outside the family bullying him. Quick to cry in deep, mournful howls, he remained the butt of derision for much of his time in Grapeland and even beyond, but he was deeply loved and respected 
by everyone in the family. The sight of my mother sobbing aroused in me the deepest feelings of uncertainty and insecurity. I searched her face to understand what she was feeling. She stood on the creaky, leaning front porch of our paint-starved house as she continued to look down at the letter. I eventually understood that Wilfred's letter had brought news of his deployment to Korea. Too young to understand the implications of this conflict in a distant country, I cared only that this news had brought Mama, the strongest person I knew, to tears. In the months that followed that moment when I saw Mama crying, I frequently thought about how my life might change unexpectedly, and over the next months, I started to pepper my mother with questions. Would she and Daddy always be there? Would my other sisters and brothers leave as Wilford, Chester, and Elbert had done? Would I see them again? Would I ever die? As a contented child, I had been immune to anxiety. Yet on the day that I began to understand Mama's fears for her children, my worries commenced, and they remained with me for most of my youth. Much later, I came to understand better the true nature of my mother's strength, but images of her vulnerability dominated these childhood years. My mother has remained somewhat of a puzzle to me. What must it have meant to be born Fanny Eula Campbell in 1906 in East Texas? She spoke of her parents as the dominant influence of her life. Their story bespeaks the values she imparted to her own children. Richard Campbell and Emma Johnson were rooted in what they had experienced from slave parents. Emma, up to her death in 1947, followed many of the practices and habits her family had acquired and preserved during slavery. She dressed like a slave for all of her 75 years, wearing long dresses made of bleached cotton canvas with an African headdress of similar fabric. She wore plain white cotton dresses during the week and striped cotton dresses on Sundays. Like most at that time, Mama Emma, which we elided to Mama Emma, had only one pair of shoes, black high top work boots with laces. She was not a large woman, but her heavy petticoats gave the impression that her slight figure was bulkier. In spite of her diminutive size, people invariably remarked on her strength, especially her ability to carry large, heavy loads on her head after the style of African women. She frequently carried water from the well with a full bucket on her head and one in each hand. Emma had an unusual way of expressing herself. Thee better get thee biscuit on that stump, she would say to grandchildren who misbehave. A woman of imposing and some would say fierce mane, she was also a memorable dis disciplinarian. She would direct the miscreants to a small tree stump that provided child-sized seating on her front porch. She and my grandfather Richard must have struck quite a picture together. She with jet black skin, wearing stark white clothing and a headdress, and he, tall, handsome, and extremely fair. When Richard died, the land he and Doc had purchased provided the only means for Mom Emma to take care of and protect her family. Emma eventually remarried, but her new husband declined to work in the fields, Emma, who couldn't bear to see her children laboring while their stepfather did nothing, confronted him. The children are in the fields and thee is in the house sleeping. Get thee things and get out, she ordered. She never married again. Keeping the homestead going with animals to tend and fields to plant was a challenge. Her three daughters and son were responsible for much of the labor. One daughter, Jim, had died in an early, in early adulthood, and a son, Richard, had been shot in the kneecap at the age of 16 while hunting with a cousin and did not survive. 
Emma managed to see the remaining children live to adulthood. When they married and had families, they settled not far from the Campbell homestead, and Emma's grandchildren became fixtures in her house. Too young when she died, I did not have the pleasure of being consigned to her tree stump for misbehaving. Richard Campbell's patrician and loving nature and Mom Emma's strength and independence helped mold my mother's spirit. Mama was quiet, reflective, kind, generous, and forgiving. The turmoil of a 12-child household did not seem to faze her, nor did the need to rise at 4 a.m. to prepare for a day of cooking, cleaning, and working in the fields. I often thought that she settled for too little in her life. She voiced no complaints except those pertaining to our misbehavior. She cared little for her appearance and seemed satisfied to comb her hair or fix her braids without fuss and to wear crude and sometimes tattered dresses that no vain woman would don. Deeply religious and attentive to following the Bible's teachings, Mama saw her life as having a specific purpose of overriding importance for seeing her children taught the right values and ensuring that they lived to adulthood. But her life was to be considerably more complicated than these simple goals she set for herself. Thank you. Thank you so much, President Simmons, for that reading and for joining us again today. Um, before we begin, I want to thank you for the work you did as president of the college, without which I have often said, I'm fairly certain I would not have been hired onto the faculty at Smith, nor would Meridians, the Women of Color Feminist Journal I now have the privilege of editing, have been founded 24 years ago, in addition to the many other transformative projects and initiatives that you seeded that have bloomed and blossomed over the past 25 years. Um, so. As you know from our earlier conversations, I've been studying up on your biography, reading interviews, essays, and even a dissertation that was written about you, as well as watching broadcasts such as Finding Your Roots episode season one, episode seven, <laughs> in case anyone wants to watch it, um, and the 60 Minutes interview with you in which you share some of the details about your family's story, as well as your own educational and professional experiences. However, Few interviewers ask you about your scholarship, even as they note that you took your PhD from Harvard in French languages, literatures, and cultures, where you were also introduced by Dr. Mercer Cook to the Negritude Movement's origins in Francophone Africa and the Caribbean, and especially the work of Martinique and Aimé Césaire and Senegalese Leopold Senghor. You also undertook a study of the educational system of Haiti in 1985 while you were on the faculty at Princeton. So I'd like to begin our conversation by asking you to speak to how your formation and contributions as a scholar of Black Francophone movements, societies, literatures, and cultures influenced or intersected with your work as an academic leader. Thank you. And uh, thank you again so, uh, so dearly for having me um, and for your care um, of Meridian, such an important project. I'm very proud of the fact that it is housed here uh, and nurtured uh, here at, at Smith as, as it should be. Well, um, uh, as, as I told you earlier, um, I think um, when I was studying, uh, people thought of, of me as an oddity uh, because it seemed rather far-fetched uh, for someone from Fifth Ward in Houston, Texas, uh, to study uh, French. And so um, they raise questions all the time about uh, how meaningful, or rather how meaningless that was in the context of the turmoil of the civil rights struggle. Um, and so, um, but because Mercer Cook did come to Harvard as a visiting professor when I was a student there, and I was introduced to the world of Francophone um, uh, Francophone literature of Africa and the Caribbean, my life changed. Um, and I came to ha have examples 
of how I could exist in the cultural environment of the country that I live in. Um, and so, as you may know, uh, Césaire and Saint-Gore undertook to shape um, uh, an expression that was unique to their cultures. Um, they asserted they were entitled to do that and that they would not be uh, a mere imitation of French language and culture. Um, they would shape their own culture while using the French language. And I just thought that was so brilliant. Um, uh, both men uh, were quite acclaimed as, um, as uh, authors, but Césaire struck me particularly as um, a magnificent human being. And uh, so I wanted to study him in particular because he was um, had an aggressive uh, style of writing uh, about his homeland, um, changing the language uh, in such a visceral way, asserting powerfully that I can speak about my culture and about my country in my own voice um, in a way that is unique. Um, and so I, I, I went to um, Martinique to meet him um, and to interview him. And I would say that that was, that was an amazing moment for me um, because uh, you see, he was, he was real. He, he was a human being that I met. And so the idea that people like him could exist, because you know, I'd read Montaigne and Dubélé and all of those people who tried to shape the French language in a unique way. But here was a man in front of me um, who was doing this. And as a consequence of that, I started thinking about what we could do in this country to shape uh, a unique uh, language, um, uh, a unique expression, um, and to assert our place in this very diverse uh, environment where we live. And that led me uh, over time to really take an interest in uh, building uh, departments um, of women's studies, of um, African-American um, and Latino studies and so forth, um, to emphasize how vital it is to a people um, to own their culture and their language and to be able to express uh, themselves fully in it. And that's really what it caused me to become a university president because I took on the uh, Afro-American study, building the Afro-American studies program at Princeton um, with some success. And as a consequence, uh, I gained a profile of building programs and that's what led me into a presidency. So, so that that really, uh, so my my academic work, um, and my scholarship, uh, at the point where I began to think that I needed to fix universities, um, took a back seat. Um, and yes, I was that uh, I was that crazy. I thought I I had an obligation to try to make these places better. Um, and so, uh, so um, my my teaching took a back seat to that, and I was busy trying to reshape what universities could be. Um, and um, but it was all from the influence of my studies uh, that caused me to do that. So you you were sharing with us earlier about the story of how you went about speaking with your colleagues, both your faculty colleagues and administrators at Princeton about the not only the need, but the fact that there was ample ample ground for establishing an Afro-American studies program. Could you share that story with the audience today around the process that you undertook with your legal pads and <laughs> how you said about creating the, the evidence? Well, I, you know, I, uh, there are certain proof points that are undeniable uh, undeniably important. At Princeton at the time, um, I would say the university uh, leadership didn't think much of Afro-American studies. Uh, it was not supported um, well at all. Um, and, um, and so um, there was no investment in it. So they came to me and asked me if I would lead Afro-American studies. Uh, and of course I said, no, I absolutely would not. Um, uh, and um, I, they asked why. I said, because 
you obviously do not care about Afro-American studies if you want to put a French professor there to lead it when they know nothing about Afro-American studies. And so um, the very fact that you don't care is enough for me to say no. Um, but they called me back and said, okay, well, Ruth, we need a blackface. Um, and so would you tell us what it would take for you to do this? And so I said, the, the eight things I need. And I ran down the list. And after each one, um, they said, done. They were pretty desperate. Um, uh, but um, the one thing that I knew, which, which I think is so important for people to understand, is that, um, of course, expertise is very important. But sometimes uh, just caring is important, too. And I knew that of all the people there, uh, I cared most about Afro-American studies, although I knew nothing about it. Um, and so uh, so I got busy. Uh, I got a legal pad, and I wrote down uh, the names of uh, scholars who could really teach Princeton a lesson if they were appointed there, OK? Because Princeton didn't understand how extraordinary it would be to have great scholars like these um, in the mix. So I, I wanted to show them that. And so I just went down the list uh, recruiting uh, faculty. And the first um, uh, faculty member that I recruited was Toni Morrison. And um, when Toni came, right after she joined the faculty, she won the Pulitzer and then, of course, the Nobel Prize. And it was like a light was turned on at that moment uh, when she won the Nobel Prize. It was a funny story. That morning, I was watching the news, and they said, uh, Toni Morrison has won the Nobel Prize. And, of course, I screamed first. <laughs> and then I called her, and I said, Toni, why didn't you tell me? And she was very annoyed. It was early in the morning. And she said, tell you what? Um, I said, why didn't you tell me that you had won the Nobel Prize? She said, but I haven't won the Nobel Prize. I haven't gotten the call yet. Yeah. No. Um, <laughs> I said, but you have because they announced it on television. She said, don't you think if I had won the Nobel Prize, I would know? <laughs> anyway. Like, like, check the voicemail. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, but they, they called her later. Uh, but it, what a transformation. Suddenly, uh, Princeton started owning the fact that they had uh, Toni Morrison and that she was a Nobel uh, Prize laureate. The president of Princeton went over for the ceremony. Um, and so forth. It was uh, so sometimes um, just showing people is much better than haranguing them. Mm -hmm. um, although I, I I didn't fall short in <laughs> haranguing people either. But but that was that was an important moment. And after that, um, it was considerably easier to make appointments across the university, including um, appointments of of, of women. Uh, on on the question of women, I was I was incensed. Uh, I was incensed about a lot. I was incensed about the fact that there were so few women faculty at Princeton, um, and in particular uh, in uh, engineering and uh, and in math. Um, math said there was no woman in the world who was qualified to be appointed to the math faculty, and they sealed that by having no women's restrooms in the math building, um, and so. I was. I thought, well, something's got to be done because we have all these women at Princeton now, and they have no uh, faculty, women faculty, and so I decided to take matters in hand <laughs> and to write a white paper about this. And of course, in typical fa fashion, I I wrote the paper. I, and that next morning, I w walked into the president's office and the provost. Uh, office and gave them a copy of my white paper and said, here, I'd like for you to read this. <laughs> and, and they did. The next day, I was called in uh, by the provost who said, we we read your white paper. I said, well, very good. And then I was turning to leave. Uh, and he, um, and uh, this was Neil Rutenstein. Um, and he said, uh, and we agree, uh, so go do it. Okay. So they gave me a fund. Uh, to fund faculty positions to appoint women in engineering and in in math, and in a single year, um, I went to math and said, um, "I know there are no women qualified to be appointed in math, but if you find any, no matter how many, 
I will give you the positions to hire them and you don't have to use any of your positions for it. And they came back with six proposals. <laughs> uh, so again, sometimes you just want to show people that, um, you know, what sometimes they truly don't understand uh, what the issue is. Well, yes, if it's free, I'll appoint a woman. But if I have to use a, a priceless um, slot uh, that could very well go to a man, I don't want to do that. Uh, and so sometimes you have to find ways to expose um, the reason that people are uh, engaged in that kind of behavior. So, so, but again, all of this is uh, largely from the kinds of things that I learned reading 16th century uh, and 17th, 18th century literature. Um, uh, and, uh, and I just feel so strongly that the humanities uh, can fuel a lot of uh, interesting approaches um, that we don't have to be studying only technical um, uh, fields. Um, so I, I, I'm really trying to uh, encourage people to read more in the humanities. And in the humanistic social sciences, that comes across in so many of the interviews and essays that you've written about these questions. Um, you also mentioned in one of the interviews that a couple of things. One is that you did your junior year as an undergraduate at Wellesley. And also that while you were at Princeton, you did a two year, I think, visiting professorship at Spelman College. So transitioning into um, your arrival at Smith, how did those experiences at these other women's colleges prepare you to come to Smith, if at all? Or what was that interaction like? Well, first of all, uh, you know, I'm I'm a product of my, um, the way that I grew up, frank, frankly. Um, it was very clear, made very clear to me uh, when I was a child that uh, I was not to be ambitious, that I was not to um, outdo um, boys in any way, uh, that I needed to be subservient um, in, you know, in every respect. And um, it was very hard to grow out of that, frankly, because uh, that continued and it was ratified in the black community large, largely um, through churches and uh, through the civil rights struggle where women's voices were muted um, in favor of showing a strong uh, black men. Um, and so uh, so I'm, I'm a product of that time and um, Really, uh, when I went to Wellesley, uh, it that was the first time um, I encountered the idea of women doing everything that men do. Um, and so the moment that I saw Margaret Clapp, president of Wellesley, yeah, she was serving tea, but but still, she was running a university. She had been an ambassador, this woman. Uh, and I thought, gee, this is- This was in the 60s, correct? Uh, or 50s? Well, yes, that was, that was in 65. And my goodness, the idea of, and of course the whole campus um, where women were empowered to do things and not take a back seat to anyone. Um, so that had a profound uh, impact on me, I would say, definitely. Um, and um, when I left Princeton, I was on a track uh, that was pretty promising, I would say, at Princeton. But I decided, well, wow, this is a very elite institution. But why don't I take what I've learned and go someplace where I can be really helpful? Um, and I decided to go to Spelman. And I didn't go as a, a visiting faculty member. I went as provost at Spelman, and um, and that was very that was a very important moment for me, um, because um, you know in some ways I learned a lot more at Spelman uh, because I couldn't get away with the same things that I got away with at Princeton. Uh, at at Princeton, I was this mad black woman, right? Um, uh, constantly 
complaining about things and then pressing the university to do certain things. Uh, but at Spelman, um, I was, uh, you know, I was the chief academic officer. Um, and here I was coming from Princeton to tell these black uh, people what they should do. Well, you see the dynamic already. And so I made a lot of mistakes when I went to Spelman in trying to bring things from Princeton uh, that were particular to Princeton to Spelman. And um, I learned my lesson um, that, that that was not suitable um, for Spelman. Um, but we did some very uh, good and important work there. Uh, but, uh, but I had to learn that every environment is different um, and not to try to import uh, ideas from places like Princeton, wherever you go. Um, and so, so those, those experience, experiences were very valuable in really um, my preparation to become a president uh, because um, I learned to listen. Uh, listening is so hard when you think <laughs> when you think you have all the answers. It's really difficult, um, and that's the way I was. Um, and so uh, that that experience at Spelman really put me on a course to be more generous um, with my uh, uh, with my work um, and to let other people into the process of shaping programs and solving problems and so forth. And I really think that that helped me immensely um, become you know, a much, much better, uh, much better person. Um, and so from, from Princeton, um, I went back to Princeton and from that experience, I was then uh, looked at to become college president. So could you share the story of how that came to pass that you, agreed to consider the presidency at Smith. And then I want to ask you another question about Spellman and the Smith connection, but we'll get back to that. Well, I, you know, I was, I had come to believe that uh, I was a bit of a pariah uh, and that because of all of my hectoring people and being so unpleasant for so many years that that would live with me forever. And I thought I would frankly not, I wasn't suitable to be an upper level um, uh, administrator or leader of a, a of a college or university. Um, uh, there was a wonderful man who was, um, well, two men at Princeton who were very instrumental uh, in my development. One was Aaron Lemonick, who was um, a terrifying man. Um, and, <laughs> um, but he was probably the first uh, person uh, in my career who was honest with me. Uh, he gave me um, criticism that wounded me deeply at the time. But of course, I now know that um, he paved the way for me to um, become the leader that I became by being honest with me. Also, I, I recognized afterwards that he respected me enough to be honest with me. So I always tell my students, get away from those faculty who are praising you and saying how wonderful you are. Find the faculty who are willing to be honest with you and respect who you are. Um, and um, and so, so the, the second person was um, the president. Uh, Harold Shapiro. And for some reason, Harold Shapiro just decided that I was on my way to a presidency. I didn't believe it, but he but he did. And so he uh, had a way of providing ways for me to learn things. And I didn't understand what was going on, but it was very helpful. So uh, one day um, uh, I was contacted by the uh, Smith board and asked if I would be willing to to be considered for um, uh, the Smith presidency. And of course I said, no, uh, I would not. Um, because honestly, um, I thought it would be a sham search. Um, in those days, um, people would include uh, blacks in searches and they had no intention of appointing a black person. 
uh, as a president. And to that point, there had never been a, a black person really appointed to a similar kind of uh, institution. And therefore I thought that they were uh, being dishonest with me. So I, I said, no, I wouldn't participate in, in a sham. Um, but they kept at, at it and, and convinced me that they were serious. And, uh, and so I uh, went for an interview and after the interview, they told me that they were focusing um, on me um, and uh, they were going to do a background check uh, and so on, which I, I was offended by that because I thought, well, are you doing background checks for everybody or are you just doing it for me because I'm black? I mean, what's what's that all about? Um, and so, uh, so, but in any case, they did it. And then um, uh, they finished their process and invited me to become president, but I still wasn't satisfied. <laughs> um, and so I had to have a heart to heart talk with the, um, uh, with the board uh, and uh, say, you know, I can't be, uh, I can't be your person. Um, I only know how to be one person and that's me. That's who I am with everything that I am. And if you want someone who can be, um, you know, uh, follow in the tradition of Smith women, uh, being very uh, poised and cultured and social and all of those good things, that's, that, that's not who I am. Many of us would disagree with that. It's uh, okay. <laughs> but, but. Well, I say that that's not who I am. And so, uh, but they said, no, we understand who you are. They didn't, um, that we understand who you are. And so we sealed the deal and I I, uh, I agreed to come. But I was, I was terrified. Um, until that point, um, nobody really knew who I was, I would say, because I was um, very proud of being a, a private person. And I was very suspicious of people who needed to know everything about me. Why? Why do you need, you need, all you need to do is see my work um, and uh, apprehend uh, my uh, intelligence. Uh, that's all you need. Why do you need the rest of it? And so, uh, so I had not disclosed an awful lot about my background at that point. And when um, the announcement of my appointment was made, and the articles came out about my um, uh, about my appointment at Smith. Then all of the details came out about my being from um, Fifth Ward, uh, having grown up poor, um, having a family of sharecroppers, and so forth. That was the first time anybody really knew that story, um, and I didn't realize that it was valuable for people to know who I was. Uh, but um, after that, and after the mail that I got from people around the country saying, um, I think I understand that there are things that I can do now. Um, so I always say to, uh, to people, it's very important for each of us to disclose who we are in full. Because somehow, I never imagined that that would inspire anybody or be um, meaningful to people. Um, and I was so wrong about it. Uh, so uh, I'm I'm glad it finally uh, came came out. And I think the relationship that I've enjoyed with my students over the years has been um, principally because they have those details about my life. Well, that that's a wonderful way to segue into a question about the actual memoir, um, because one of the things that again that I noticed in in reading the interviews and listening to the interviews is that you do share bits and pieces of your story um, at the point that you are writing about these things when you're president of Smith and are, are now in national prominence in these ways and subsequently of Brown. Um, you share the stories about your mom, you mentioned Grapeland and so forth. But but really, it's not until the memoir that you offer us the fuller account. And, and actually, one of my students in a class that I'm teaching um, sent along a lovely question, and I'll paraphrase it for her, but it's basically about one of the most challenging things about writing a memoir is that balance between be revealing aspects of one's story and by extension, our families and our communities and, and the other players in our live story um, and preserving privacy or discretion. And, and that is such a difficult line to walk. Um, so as a memoirist now, I was wondering if you could 
speak with us a little bit about that, that the challenge of both revelation of self, because it does provide inspiration. It is a role model. You are a first in so many ways, including in your own family. Um, and so many of us are inspired and need that. On the other hand, not every reader, not every listener is going to be supportive or, or generous, right, with us. So how, how has that been for you, Dr. Simmons, that balance between revealing mm -hmm. and preserving? Well, uh, certainly um, when I uh, decided to write it, um, I had to determine whether or not I could do it truthfully and fully. I knew beforehand that I would not complete it if I couldn't do that. So one of the things that's most important, I think, for me, and goes back to my mother, certainly, was for every part of my character and my life and my actions to be attuned to the truth um, of what I believe um, and who I am. And I struggled for a while with whether or not I could actually write it um, because um, I didn't know whether or not I could be fully truthful, um, given the fact that it would be um, harmful in some instances to people um, if I did that. Um, but I had a choice. This is not the book people wanted from me. The book people want from me is the inside story of higher education. That's what they want from me. Um, and then I knew for sure that telling those stories would be very explosive. Um, and therefore, I was very reluctant to start there. Um, and so I wanted to start with myself and whether or not I had the courage to do that fully. So I think in writing a memoir, you have to make that decision first. Uh, how how, uh, how um, fulsome are you willing to be with who you are? Um, and if you're not, you probably shouldn't write it because people will be able to see through that. Um, but, uh, but there were very uh, definitely parts of the book that were very hard to write. Um, I didn't know, for example, whether I would be able to write anything about my mother because my mother died when I was 15. I have mourned her death for every moment of my life since. And for most of that time, I couldn't even speak about it. So, and sometimes now I can't speak, I can't speak about it. Um, so I didn't, I didn't know if I could write about her in particular, uh, because it would be so difficult to do. Um, and I knew if I wrote about my father, I would have to write the truth about my father. He was a very complicated um uh man who uh was um imprisoned uh by the circumstances of his time. And um, but I wanted to tell the truth about him too. So uh, so it was a struggle, and I didn't I didn't look for a precise balance between the one and the other. Um, I just sat down and um, and tried to communicate as much as I could about what I had lived um, and how I felt about what I had lived. So I, I want to quote something you said in one of your essays. In 1998, while president of Smith College, you published an essay entitled, quote, My Mother's Daughter, Lessons I Learned in Civility and Authenticity, which was reprinted 10 years later during your presidency at Brown University by the Texas Journal of Ideas, History, and Culture in celebration of Women's History Month. In that beautiful essay, which I recommend highly, by the way, to everyone, um, you pay homage to how your mother, quote, showed you how she could with grace, magnanimity, and aplomb carry out the most difficult and most unfulfilling work, which one could say about you as well, Dr. Simmons, in terms of the leadership roles that you have played. So many of the questions we got from the alums were, were asking about your time at Smith and if you could share with us, reflect with us um, how what you remember most about that time, how your mother's example carried you through some of the difficult moments perhaps of being president of Smith um, 
and also this question of civility and authenticity, because um, that is a perennial question, right, in, in university spaces and college spaces where debate is at the heart of what we do. So that's a, a, a very complicated question, but yeah, any part of that? Well, um, first of all, I, I was I was beyond happy as Smith's president. Um, first, because the students welcomed me so warmly. Really, I mean, in a world in which, um, you know, it the, there is there's often awkwardness between faculty and students, between administration and and students. Um, I just couldn't believe how warm uh, and accepting uh, people were of me here at Smith, and that took me a bit by uh, surprise. Um, and in some, you know, there's some silly things that happened here that I, I always remember um, as an example of um, something I wasn't trying to do, but that happened nonetheless. So I was, um, I'd gone to the faculty club for an event one day and I was um, uh, driving back up, uh, campus and I noticed there was a Smith student struggling uh, who was on crutches. She was struggling to get up the, the, the hill. And I stopped, of course, and said, um, get in, <laughs> I'll take you where you need to go. And then to my horror, she said, President Simmons, no, if you could do what you've done, with your challenges, I can certainly get up this hill on crutches. And I thought, well, how, that's not that's not what I want. That's not what I want people to think. Okay. <laughs> um, and so, I uh, one of the things that I was always struggling with is try to try to bring that down a notch. Okay, because um, I wanted people to see me um, for who I am and not um, venerate me to. Uh, a ridiculous degree. Um, and I didn't want that gap to be so wide. And that's why I always insist that students call me Ruth and uh, and not treat me as um, an iconic individual um, or as a mythic individual who struggled through all kinds <laughs> of things and overcame. I mean, that's ridiculous. So, because, and the, partly I didn't want that because I want them to see that every avenue is open to them to learn, to take advantage of, um, uh, of what they uh, encounter, um, to be open to other people. Um, and that's why I always um, wanted, I always talk to students about sharing who they are with others to, uh, and communicating across vast uh, differences. Uh, because if you can't do that in college, you're certainly not gonna be able to do it after you leave college. And we have a country that is in deep trouble uh, because we still have not learned the fundamental elements of talking to each other um, uh, respectfully um, and uh, and caring about others different from our group. Um, and so I, I felt here at Smith that I, for the first time, had a way of, of um, taking on the pastoral role and caring for um, students, um, trying to uphold certain values to them, and hoping that somehow by doing that, um, their lives would be uh, more uh, meaningful because I tried to live those values and they could see those values reflected in me. Um, and so that's so that's that was something that I didn't know I had exactly mm -hmm. until I came to Smith. Uh, but but students were so responsive that I began to um, uh, learn um, that in a way that and and the and the way that they treated me was uh, eventually so comforting. Except in one instance when uh, I was trying to raise money for the campus center. And um, I went out to California to see Mrs. Hewlett uh, of Hewlett Packard. 
Um, and I thought, well, she has enough money to, you know, pay for a campus center for Smith, <laughs> and she was a Smith alum. So I invited her to come for a visit. And she was lovely. She came for a visit and she was staying at um, at the president's house. And I was very excited. And we came down and we were at breakfast um, and we were chatting and there was a noise outside. And I thought, well, OK, the doorbell rang, I think. And I decided, OK, well, the doorbell's ringing. And I knew that the staff were busy. So I got up from the table to go to the door. Meanwhile, I saw the staff running toward me, <laughs> asking me not to open the door. No, don't open the door. Right. <laughs> um, but it was too late because I opened the door. And there are these um, uh, uh, these these women in um, various uh various stages of nudity um, <laughs> in the in the yard. Smith. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and so, and then I think, oh dear, Mrs. <laughs> Hewlett, you know, is here. And so she came out. Uh, she heard the noise because the students were cheering or something. Uh, uh, and uh, she saw the students in this state and she was she laughed so <laughs> she thought it was hilarious um and and so on so um so sometimes uh there were antics that were a little bit um uh challenging for me to deal with but otherwise uh it was um they they treated me with such um uh love and respect and i'm forever grateful for that well, I have to say that as a faculty member who arrived at Smith, as I said, during your presidency, I think that that sentiment extended into the faculty, particularly those of us who um, were part of the, the newer cohort that that uh, you welcomed into the college. And um, I think I think I can safely say that because of that, we have uh, helped to transform Smith into the the kind of institution that that you'd hoped we would become. Definitely. Uh, as part of that, you were instrumental in the founding of the journal Meridians. This morning, um, we were able to show you the exhibit that we put up with the 24 year Wonderful. history. Wonderful. We're about to come on our 25th anniversary. And five years. No, <gasps> it's hard to believe. Oh my. So I was hoping you could say a word or two about that because as I understand the, the story, a group of my senior colleagues, most of whom have retired now with the exception of Vicki Spellman, who's joining us here today and is about to retire, um, approached you with an idea about founding this journal at Smith. So could you say a little bit about that and how it was of a piece, I would argue, with the work you had been doing for decades already around transforming the academy? Well, certainly, um, you know, one of the biggest challenges at that time uh, was the fact that um, scholars couldn't get published. Because perforce, if you wrote about uh, issues of concern to, to women or uh, to minorities, um, finding, um, finding a venue uh, for publishing that work was very, very challenging. So when the idea came for a, a journal that focused on, um, on women, um, of many cultures, um, and um, but but here a a journal that was refereed, where scholars could get their work published. I thought it was a brilliant idea, um, and that it really belonged at a place like Smith. Um, and so I was very happy to uh, to support it and uh, thrilled that we had an opportunity to make an important statement. And that statement was about the way the academy organizes itself to exclude, uh, to exclude people who may think differently, to exclude um, ideas that are, are different, to exclude people who present a different profile. And so I was always trying to tweak that um, at every opportunity. And so when I was working on the appointment of Toni Morrison, who did not have a PhD, um, and um, I thought she should have an appointment uh, as a chaired professor in English without a PhD, um, uh, for example, and when I brought Paula Giddings here without a PhD, um, because her work stood for 
what her value was and nobody had ever seen it. They would only give her temporary appointments up until the moment she came to Smith as a tenured professor. So um, every time we have an opportunity to show the ways in which we can improve um, the academy or improve society, we ought to be busy trying to do that. And Meridians was one of those ways of getting in front of people and saying, this is what is missing from the academy. Absolutely. And it really, it it has, I think, transformed the academy and multiple fields of knowledge. And it has played a central role in um, tenure because we have hewed to the highest standard of yes. double anonymized peer review. And we're now published by a tier one university yes. press and so forth. And um, your quote from volume one, number one, graces almost everything that we put out in the world. Women of color have many histories, and these histories can be brought into full and sharp relief by providing opportunities for these women to speak for themselves. Um, and certainly that is our mission and to speak for themselves. And that's why your memoir, it's so, so much a part of that. Um, let's see. I want to ask you some of the questions that the alumni sent in. One of them was, um, well, they all, they said over and over again that you were president for many of their uh, four years. They felt such great admiration for you. Um, and if you have a favorite memory other than the invasion by the near naked students while you were hosting, <laughs> <laughs> or you were hosting uh, Ms. Hewlett. Oh, goodness. There's so many, there's so many, oh, there's so many memorable stories. Good goodness. Um, we brought Ruth Bader Ginsburg here. Um, and why do I always recall the troubling ones? But anyway, um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was um, here for an event and um, she was staying at the president's house. And um, I got up early uh, to go down and make sure she had breakfast and all that sort of thing. Um, and I was down there. She had brought her granddaughter uh, who was I think about um, seven years old or so. Um, and uh, I was downstairs uh, and her granddaughter came down and said, I can't wake grandma. I said, oh, don't, don't worry. She's sleeping soundly. I'll go back upstairs and then put your hand on her shoulder and shake her gently and call her name. And I'm sure she'll wake up. So she went up and she did that. And then she came back and she said, I still can't wake grandma. Well, now I'm going into full panic mode <laughs> because I'm saying to myself, Ruth Bader Ginsburg will not die in this house. Okay. I was, I was panicked, absolutely panicked. But I didn't know what to do because with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, I couldn't go up there and <laughs> and into the room and say, "Wake up!" Right? <laughs> right? Yeah, I couldn't do that. So I'm 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 just immobilized. So finally, I decide I could either stay downstairs and fall apart, or I could go. I could be brave enough to go up there and walk in her room, right? And that's what I did. So I I said, "Come on, let's let's go up." So I knocked on the door, no answer. I knocked again, no answer. I opened the door and I walked in. She was in bed. I walked over to her and I touched her and I said, Justice Ginsburg, <laughs> Justice Ginsburg. And she woke up. <laughs> I said, oh, I'm so sorry. But your granddaughter was so worried because you didn't wake up when she tried to wake you up. So, I mean, that, that's, you know, that's, that, that's that, that, was, that was, that uh, was, okay. that was, but, um, but I remember with great fondness, all the extraordinary people who came here um, to uh, interact with students. Um, to talk about their lives um, and and so on. And of course, there's so many famous women associated with uh, with uh, with Smith and will be forever um, that, you know, I also remember um, Barbara Bush and President Bush 
um, inviting me to uh, Kennebunkport for a day. And uh, it was, in many ways, very um, interesting and strange day. Uh, but um, but it was a glorious day, quite quite beautiful. And in fact, a, a, a photograph of, of of me with President and and Mrs. Bush on on the rocks um, overlooking the the um, uh, the the water uh, is on my desk. But uh, but the thing is that. Um, the unsettling thing was that they were really very Republican and, and I'm not. <laughs> and so we were chatting and they were probing uh, for my opinion about various things. And doggone it, they asked me about my opinion of Clarence Thomas and they're very fond of him. Yeah, yeah very fond of him. And um, and didn't I think he was the most marvelous man and so forth. So I also remember circumstances where I had to really be um, able to express my views without offense mm -hmm. um, and, um, uh, and, and really to understand that there were people who thought, who saw life differently from me, okay? Um, and uh, and that's a, that that's an example. There were many examples of people associated with um, with the uh, the college who uh, were very different in their views. Uh, and um, and I'm now actually I've just been asked by Neil Bush to serve on the Barbara Bush Foundation, uh, um, which I I have agreed to do, and I'm happy to, her literacy foundation. Um, because I'm working on literacy programs in 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 Texas, um, so I, there's so many wonderful um, events. I, Mountain Day, oh my goodness! Um, uh, you know the pressure, the pressure about when to declare. It. Oh. <laughs> When is, when is it going to when is it going to be and all of that oh my goodness and um the traditions oh the traditions right rally oh rally day and and the oh wow um i'll never forget that first day that i visited smith um because you know you couldn't visit before you were appointed so so anyway the first day i visited smith and I think I have my speech that I made. I might send it to the library here. That would be um, and, and the emotion um, that I felt, you know, coming to campus and and um, talking about why I was here and what I wanted to do here and so on. Um, I remember, uh, of course, the debates about engineering and whether or not it was the right thing to do at a college um, like Smith, after all, um, to do engineering. What kind of crazy idea was that? And I remember people's reaction when they said, well, the, we have no room for engineering here. There's no room. And I said, that's OK. I'll put up a temporary building. So we, and we did. Um, and, and then you know, Ford came along and said they wanted to support a permanent building for um, for for engineering. So there's so many, oh my goodness, there's so many wonderful stories like that. You know, and I don't know if you if you read the news that it was a Smith uh, engineering team of, of current students and alums and a Smith professor that um, answered the challenge to come up with a, a respirator that could be put together during the pandemic. Yes. Um, it was the Smith team that yeah. won that well, of course. engineering. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. So <laughs> that's what we knew all along, exactly. right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so I, I know we're at Smith and that we should focus mostly on Smith, but I, I want to ask you also about and not only the work you did at Brown, which was also groundbreaking, particularly around the um, call to confront Brown's legacy and its relationship to the history of enslavement in this country. Um, and then subsequently, you retired for a minute and were called back into service at Prairie Review. So could you um, say a little bit for us about the work you did after Smith and where you are today and the work you're doing today? Uh, well, um, I, I regard it as all of a piece, really. Um, when I got to Brown, the, you know, this question of... Um, uh, of institutions involved with the uh, transatlantic slave trade was swirling. 
and um, and uh, alumni ask, well, what is the true story? Uh, were people, uh, were founders at Brown involved in the transatlantic slave trade? And so uh, I thought, well, that's a fair question and somehow we should answer it. Um, and so um, I went to as many places as I could to find out what the answer was. It was all, all um, erased um, and um, denied by everybody that there was any connection. And wasn't there that article by David Horowitz, that horrible article that he wrote? Well, that was the first thing I uh, uh, confronted the the uh, the ad, um, and uh, you know, I guess it was enough of a shock for people to have uh, an African American uh, president um, of an Ivy League institution that suddenly everything that that had to do with anything uh, black was had a special challenge for me but the first thing was that before i even got there uh there was an ad in the paper uh saying that african americans were lucky to have been enslaved uh because uh had they been left in africa um look what their lives would be so this wonderful gentleman had put the, an ad in the newspaper to David say Horowitz. that uh yeah, and um, and so immediately um, the students at Brown ran around the campus uh, picking up all the newspapers and destroying them, uh, and they got into trouble for doing that because you can't do that, right? Um, and so the campus was was in a state when I when I got there about this Horowitz incident, um, but the Rep young uh, the. Republicans on campus decided they wanted to invite him to campus. And so then the students demanded to know what I was going to do about that. Uh, they insisted that the invitation be blocked, that he not come to campus uh, with his heinous views and so forth. Um, and so I said, well, yes, of course, um, they, they are heinous views, but universities don't block um, you know, uh, opposing um, opposing views. And furthermore, this is a campus organization and they have asked to have this speaker. And if we don't allow him to speak, when you have your speakers come to campus, um, shall I then uh, pull the plug on them? So we're gonna have him come to campus. Um, and so there was a lot of turmoil about it. And in the end, I, I just said, um, I am the descendant of slaves. If I can go and sit in a room and listen to him say those things, you can damn well do it too. Um, and so he came, we had that event, um, and uh, people had a chance to uh, ask him questions and so forth. And uh, that was it. It was uh, that it, it sort of disappeared after that. Um, and that was helpful to me in preparing me for the slavery um, issue because uh, I learned eventually that in leadership, sometimes it really is all about you and who you are and what you value and what you represent, not in the moment when there's a crisis, but the rest of the time. And so, uh, and so I uh, tried to do as Amy Gutman um, uh, recommends in, um, in talking about uh, how leaders should project their actions. Uh, and her point is that we shouldn't be, um, uh, we should not be uh, making decisions uh, without revealing in the course of time um, the ways in which we are reacting and formulating our ideas. Mm -hmm. And so we should talk more about what we worry about, about what we find difficult and troubling. Um, and the more we do that as leaders, the more people will understand that when our decisions emerge, they are a consequence of the agony of trying to um, work through uh, the um, various aspects of a uh, of a problem. So I I tried doing that more 
um, as a consequence of the Horowitz um, affair. Uh, and so when the slavery issue came up, um, I decided we would get to the truth and I appointed a commission. But as soon as I did that, the place went wild and people from all over the country um, uh, really <laughs> seemed to think I had lost my mind, including my friends. Mm -hmm. And um, the thing that was so remarkable about it is that everybody was very fearful about it. Uh, not just um, uh, people who thought they had something to lose if we called for reparations, but also Blacks. And so my Black friends were saying, you have lost your mind because you're going to make it impossible for any Black person to ever become a president again mm -hmm. because of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Wrong. <laughs> um so uh, so anyway, so um, I also remember in in heated moments, our proclivity as academics to be complex and nuanced doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And so I learned to be very plain, very simple, um, and to look for the unimpeachable. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, and so in that regard, I simply said when people uh, ask, what are you doing? Um, you know, why are you doing this? Um, I always said, um, uh, people have asked a question about our history. And I think we should tell the truth about that history because if we lie as a university, how can you trust anything that we teach or anything that we do? And so universities should be about truth and we will tell the truth no matter what it is. And I just kept saying that over and over and over again and not trying to make it very complicated. Um, and so um, we worked our way through it. And of course the ridiculous thing is that since it was the worst possible thing that had ever happened, uh, now hundreds of places have imitated it <laughs> and so forth. So I, I don't know. I never would have thought that that would become the most famous thing I ever did. But <laughs> um, but certainly the the uh, uh, issue of uh, slavery and its aftermath has become uh, uh, still a very big issue. Last week I was at um, at Georgetown University which followed our study and, and did one of their own. And they've had a remarkable uh, ongoing process involved with the Jesuits trying to um, uh, disclose as much as they can about the history of the, um, the uh, Catholic Church and slavery. Um, and that work is still being uncovered. Uh, two weeks before I was at LSU, and they're just starting their slavery uh, project uh, there. Um, so it's going on and before it's all done, there will be hundreds of um, universities and institutions that do this work based on the study that they did at Brown. I, did, I have to ask as a Smith alum and Smith faculty member who does work on race, did the question ever come up at Smith while you were here or no. subsequently? It didn't. Students, note to self. Um, Tell us a little bit about you retired ostensibly. You went <laughs> home to Texas to to reunite with your family and, in theory, to rest. Um, but instead, you answered the call to become president of uh, Prairie View. Could you tell us a little bit about that experience, which you just stepped down from last year? Correct. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I have never been a fan of the way uh, that we categorize uh, educational institutions. Um, the so-called elite institutions, um, the not-so-elite institutions. Um, and I have tried to make it a practice to move among um, uh, educational institutions as a statement that I value education. I don't value um, the ratification of status. I value education itself. And so, uh, and so uh, the reason I left Princeton to go to Spelman is because I wanted to show that the value of um, uh, a, a African-American women's institution 
Um, and uh, and so when they approached me, I said, well, no, I'm retired uh, and I don't want to do that. But uh, then um, they said, well, it's going to be a short time. And I looked at those students and I said, well, I value them as much as I value my students at Brown. Why would I why would I say no if I had something to offer? And so I think uh, I'm still very interested in um, breaking up this um, this really um, vile way in higher education that we allow others to do our work for us. Okay, uh, and so we don't we don't vet faculty. Uh, we uh, look for proxies for vetting them. So where where were they educated? Where are they coming from? Um, if they're coming from a, a community college, it doesn't matter how good their work is, um, they're not going to get an appointment um, at um, certain institutions, right? So we are we are best at vetting work, and yet we don't we're lazy. We don't do that. We allow other factors to um, to interfere with our ability to judge um, the uh, ability of students. Uh, and so forth. So I was on this tear when I was uh, at Brown to get all of the Ivies to admit more community college students. And so I'd go, I'd go to meetings and I'd you know make my pitch and say how uh, how important it would be and so forth. Um, but I mean they finally come come around to it more now. Um, but it took uh, it, it took a lot of doing to get them to say. Yes, there are good students at community colleges, and we ought to be admitting um, as many of them as we can. Um, and so, uh, so I think um, my feeling with HBCUs is that um, they are an incredible resource and have been for a long time in this country. Uh, they have not gotten their due by any means. And the way that I got um, involved with the Harvard project is when Harvard asked me to do uh, the commencement speech, uh, their commencement speech a few years ago, um, I put in my commencement speech that Harvard uh, had benefited uh, for centuries from the, uh, um, the accrual of wealth, um, while HBCUs um, had um, uh, almost often perished uh, from the accrual of poverty, uh, and that Harvard had an obligation um, as a part of the higher education community to care about what has happened with institutions that have not had um, the support they deserve. So I'm still running my mouth in the same way I did, you know, years ago, um, years ago at Princeton. And there's always, there's always something I'm trying to fix. Yeah. And, and I guess that's, you know, that's why I can't retire. <laughs> well, well, we appreciate it. Um, I realize I have not given the audience an opportunity to ask any questions. Are there folks with a question that would like to come up to the mic? Because if so, um, we would welcome that. I didn't, do you want to come up to the mic, Ali? Do you mind? Yeah. I can ask a question. I'm sorry. I've been, I've been hogging President Simmons all to myself. But so you've hinted a little bit um, throughout the questions about the different uh, missions you've taken on, basically. But how would you say, in your tenure as an administration, as an administrator has spanned decades, are there any challenges you'd say particularly changed over that period? In in the sense of having uh, been ameliorated, or 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 what? just how would you say that some of the challenges look different now than they did when you started your career um as an administrator uh, well i mean certainly thank you for asking that certainly don't don't you think that uh today women are in a much stronger position uh in uh universities than they were by far uh when i when i started out um and so i think that universities have dealt um, uh, to some extent um, with the gender issue. Um, I think it's not completely uh, addressed because uh, women are also under attack in this moment. 
uh, as leaders, and people are now trying to understand what that's all about and where that's going to lead. But I do think that on, on the whole, uh, women uh, have found uh, much better opportunities in higher education, both on the faculty um, and in uh, administration uh, than they uh, they had when I started. When I was um, uh, just starting as a faculty member, uh, I had a I had an infant son at the time, and um, you know the faculty meetings would be called, and you know you couldn't I couldn't find a um, a sitter and so forth. So I remember uh, I took my son. I don't know if you've ever heard this story. I took my son as an infant into a faculty meeting, um, and. Um, but I think that the um, the, the challenges of, um, of parenting uh, have been uh, better addressed um, in the modern academy, uh, I, I would say. I also think that um, there are certain kinds of things that simply don't exist at all anymore uh, in the way people behave in the academy. Um, and this will surprise you perhaps because of some of the things that recently you've heard people saying in regard to the Harvard situation. But um, but it it used to be um, a constant um, uh, constant uh, examples of harassment and aggression against people who were different in the academy. Uh, that was not at all unusual. I think that's abated. Um, significantly in spite of what you may see in certain high profile instances. Uh, I think it's just a better, it's a better environment. Um, I think that uh, I was meeting uh, with a group of uh, new faculty at Trinity uh, University uh, on Friday. And it was amazing to me to see them because they were all so different. Uh, one faculty member uh, was wearing one orange sneaker and one green sneaker. This is the faculty, okay? Um, and, you know, uh, in the days when you had to dress a certain way, you had to look a certain way, uh, you had to be, you know, you had to have certain social skills and so forth, it's completely different. You can be who you are fully um, in even, even in conservative Texas, um, these faculty are expressing themselves in the way that they want to express themselves. And that is a, that is a really fantastic change from where, uh, where it all started. Now, I, I can't tell you where things are going to go with the attacks on DEI and so forth. And our governor, who is hell-bent on um, moving back, turning back the clock. But, but right now, um, it's an amazing thing to see uh, what is possible on these campuses because um, things have changed. And I think that's a, actually a perfect place to end. It is our time. I want to thank you again, President Simmons, for joining us. I want to thank you for this beautiful book. Um, thank Just you. thank you. No, thank, thank you. Again. you. Thank you.